I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Ballara and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today I'm here with Ashley Wilson. Ashley, thanks for coming on the podcast today. Thank you for having me, Jason. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ashley, I probably doesn't need a whole lot of introduction, but uh, you're the co-founder of Bar Down Investments um, and also House It Look, the flipping company you had with your father. And then in addition to that, uh, a best-selling author of The Only Woman in the Room. So uh, there's I, there's so much that we can talk about. I'm, I'm really excited, but I'd love it if maybe we can just start with you kind of sharing your story, what brought you into real estate, kind of your background and everything like that. So, so people, you know, kind of know that and then we'll, we'll take it wherever you want. So about 12 or 13 years ago, my husband and I were looking for ways to diversify our retirement strategy and we weren't firm believers in the stock market. So we stumbled upon real estate after looking at a few different alternative investments. And then what we ultimately did is we continued our day job, so to speak, while investing on the side. We started with house hacking, short-term rentals, and then long-term rentals. And then we quickly realized all of the benefits of real estate. And I left my W-2 to work full-time in real estate. My husband finished out his career and then he transitioned once he retired um, from his career to full-time in real estate as well. So we have been in real estate now for quite some time. In the beginning, obviously it was more as a side hustle and now it's, you know, our living, breathing full-time gig. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so I guess, what did you start with? Was it kind of the, the flipping business or the um, multifamily work, or did you kind of go into that both at the same time? How, how did you, where did you first kind of take it, I guess, at, at that point? The first thing we started with, that was actually house hacking. So we started with house hacking by renting out rooms to my husband's teammates. So my husband was a professional athlete and um, we would go from city to city and we'd obviously needed a place to stay. So we would rent or buy, excuse me, we bought a uh, property that had multiple rooms and then rented out those rooms to his teammates. Um, I worked in pharmaceuticals. I actually worked on global vaccine development in clinical trials. Um, and that's lent itself to be a very um, time intense job. So I had to set up something that was pretty uh, automated and short-term rentals, you know, which was our next uh, foray in uh, real estate was very easy to automate even back then. Um, today, obviously we have things that can be, pro, you know, key systems that can be programmed through your phone, which would make it even easier. But even back then with locks, key locks and other type of backup systems, for me, it forced me to figure out ways to automate the process. So short-term rentals were, our net was our next step. And then after that, we had long-term renters um, in a couple properties. And then after that, my dad is a general contractor and I saw him partnering with other people to flip houses. And I was thinking to myself, why am I not just doing it with my father? He's an amazing partner and extremely knowledgeable. He's been in construction and has had his own business for over 40 years. So he's a perfect fit. So that's how we started with flipping. And then um, there's just so many major benefits in purchasing large apartment buildings, tax benefits, hedge against inflation. Um, also too, if you look at the housing shortage crisis that we have, it makes sense 
economies of scale. I mean, there's so many benefits with the multifamily sector. So <clears throat> we knew the next step was something bigger and we just figured out after analyzing 22 different asset classes, to be honest with you, within real estate, that multifamily was the perfect fit for what my husband and I were seeking out of life. Um, so that's when we transitioned into multifamily and I leveraged my experience with construction and construction management to put us in a situation where we could partner with another group and then kind of the rest is history. We figured out that we really loved this space and wanted to start doing it on our own. And that's what we have done over the past few years. Yeah. It's actually really, I mean, I think using the, um, you know, house hacking strategy with your husband's teammates, I, I've never heard of that before. I mean, I hear people, I've heard of house hacking, but I've never heard of, from an athlete standpoint, using that to their advantage. And maybe it's happening and you just don't hear about it, but I think that's actually a, a very cool uh, way to take advantage of the of the travel that's associated with it. So that that's a pretty cool, I guess, introduction. And then having your dad as a contractor and having that you know, sort of influence in your life, it, it does seem a lot of times, and I, and I, I find this, in other guests that I've interviewed that it's almost like sometimes those things are, are right in front of us. Like we have a family member or something like that, that it's like you grew up around this and, and for whatever reason you try to escape it or get away from it, or, or, or you're just like, I'm going to do my own thing because I want to be independent. And then people come back around and, and say, Hey, you know what? Like my dad's doing something pretty amazing. I, I want to get into that and, and kind of work that way. I, I always, I always like that sort of full cycle type of um, story. So you're, are you still working in the flipping business at this point? I, I imagine you're not doing it yourself, but are you still a part of that with your dad? Yes, we still have our business. Um, we don't have any inventory at this point. We've kind of been in a holding pattern. We've been looking at a few deals, but nothing really pencils out for us at this point with the residential real estate being as hot as it is. It's not as much as the residential real estate being, uh, you know, what some would argue overvalued, it's the concern for me, we, our whole business model is full gut renovations. Full gut renovations have high risk, high reward. With um, smaller renovation projects, it's easier to determine what the market will be like in a few months. But with the current economic environment, it's very difficult to predict what the economy is going to be like in six to eight months out. And that's when we would be delivering on our renovation. So for us, it makes it very challenging to underwrite, um, you know, in a conservative banner, which is, I know a lot of people say that they do that. Um, and I think very few do, us being one of them. So that puts us, it's not a matter of us just saying, you know, there aren't deals to be had. There are definitely deals to be had. It's just a little bit of uncertainty in the current economic landscape we find ourselves in. Yeah. Yeah. And it, that's a good point in the sense that flipping maybe that, uh, that time frame makes, a, it has a much bigger impact on things like what you're doing in multifamily, where it's like, you're going to hold it for a period of time, whether that's five or seven years, you can adjust that. But when you're, if you're just trying to flip something, as you said, you know, if it takes six or eight months, you don't really know what the property values are going to be at that point. And it's, I, I imagine it's probably hard to count on them continuing to go crazy like they have over the last six to eight months. So I, I, you know, you you could hit a home run, but you could also get in trouble. So yeah, if you're being conservative, it, it makes sense to kind of, um, you know, kind of sit back a little bit. So uh, very interesting. And so with multifamily then, and I, I know you said sort of leveraged your experience in construction, and I've, I've heard you sort of talk about this before, where you, and correct me if I'm wrong, you essentially a deal wasn't going well and then and then you needed to step in and take over construction management asset management is that is that sort of what happened or um how did i guess 
I think the asset management and the construction management side of multifamily is, is very interesting to me, but also there's a number of steps before getting there on each particular deal. So when you, when that's your strength, how did you sort of come into it that way? Uh, you just, what made, did you have previous existing relationships or did you just kind of go out there and say, I'm going to, I'm going to try to connect with uh, certain people? So for, for the first commercial deal that I did, um, I had a friend in real estate who um, had been an investor for a long period of time. And um, he was someone that I constantly stayed in touch with and networked with. Um, I actually met him through bigger pockets, ironically, but he was just lived close by. And anytime I was back in town, I made a point of meeting up with him and checking in with him and, um, you know, just being very transparent about where I was and what my next step was. And when I met with him, obviously the last time before we partnered together, um, we had talked about partnering together on some other deals because he was not into construction at all. Like, so he would find a few houses and, you know, we looked at them because we thought we were going to partner together on the flipping side. But ultimately what ended up happening is when I told him that I wanted to go into commercial and in large multifamily, I didn't know that he was also doing that because he's just very well diversified. And it just so happened he had a property under contract that had roughly a $2 million construction project. And one major component of that was a building that needs to be completely rebuilt um, because it burnt down in a fire. So because of that, um, he needed someone who had construction experience and he was looking for someone anyway. So it was kind of a perfect situation. We had known each other for five years at that point. And, um, you know, it, it was a good opportunity for both of us. So we started working together. And then as the deal was going on, um, I just noticed that no one was really managing the asset because his, him and his team were working on acquiring new properties as opposed to managing the ones we had. Um, so I absorbed that responsibility. Um, and, I did not know what I was doing at all. Um, I ordered every single book on Amazon about asset management for which I found that um, no one really talks about asset management in the books that are even titled asset management. It's very um, glossed over. And I think in part, it's because people aren't truly asset managing. And then in part, because the people who are truly asset managing know that it's the secret sauce that makes um, a company, you know, a billion dollar company versus a company that, you know, has maybe, you know, I don't know, few assets under management, I guess. Yeah. Um, but ultimately I think it can be a huge game changer and it, I saw that immediately, you know, that's the great thing about asset management. It's kind of like vacuuming a dirty rug. You see the fruits of your labor instantly. And um, that's what I was seeing. So I really enjoyed it. And I also, once I started doing it, I started realizing the benefits of having someone. I mean, I obviously have a bias because I was that someone, but having someone who had knowledge of both asset and construction management, because there's so much interplay. Like for example, you know, month to month, the demand on certain unit types can change. So if you have construction management, you know, um, targeting certain units to renovate and all of a sudden the demand shifts and one unit type is more in demand than another, then why should you continue renovating the other one if you can get a greater yield on units that are in more demand? You know, so like knowing those types of things are, are really important. Um, but, you know, it's obvious that you have to stay on top of the market because the market dictates everything. Um, and the second you take your foot off the gas pedal, so to speak, uh, you can be left behind pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think the, the point you brought up about sort of the lack of resources on asset management, it, it's like 
I've, I've, you know, in my sort of journey into this, I've noticed that a lot. It's like, there's, there's a million books on acquisitions. There's a million books on sort of all the steps that go into that to getting the deal under contract. But then when it comes to the actual asset management, it's almost like, good luck. Hope you pick a good property management company. You know, it's not very, it's not as uh, spoken of, but, but I think you're right. Like that's, that's the opportunity. Right, like, because everybody, everybody's competing for the same deals. So if if you get the deal and then you, you manage it very, very well, that that's where the the chance to really, like you said, go from, you know, maybe the the almost like hobbyist, I own a few places, to being a true, you know, billion dollar real estate investment company. So that's pretty cool. Um, do you? How would you correlate the construction management of say these residential flips that you're doing versus the the multifamily commercial space because because your your background was in residential right and then you you you, it seems like you stepped in fairly well and smoothly into fairly well like (laughs) doing great but like that transition how how was that for you how did you feel maybe speak to some of the differences because i do think a lot of people think Oh, we start in single family, we start in residential, and then when they want to scale, they move up to multifamily. Do you think that it correlates? I think it correlates. I think every part of your journey, if you want it to, can help you with where you are today. So for example, things that I did working for Santa Fe Aventis, Glaxo, and Wyeth apply to what I'm doing today. Um, it's, it's crazy to see all of the parallels um, but with, with residential, when you're looking at construction, there are different types of construction, but the mechanics are the same. And, you know, what type of um, electric panel you put into a residential home still varies by square footage. You know, you can get a hundred amp in a small, like 800 square foot house, um, you know, and you might need a 200 amp in, let's say, a 15 hundred square house and up. Um, And then in commercial, you have main panels and then you have uh, small electrical panels and individual units that service off the main. So if you understand conceptually, I don't pretend to be a general contractor. I don't pretend to be an expert in construction, but I am very knowledgeable and I do understand the mechanics. I do understand construction. Um, And if I don't understand, I'm going to tell you, I don't understand. And I'm going to ask you questions and I'm going to research it. And I'm going to try to figure out as much as I possibly can know. If there's one thing about me, if I don't know something, I, I've always had a passion for learning. And I think if that is your mindset, you'll never fail because if you're always looking to learn and figure out better ways to do things and to understand so you can um, be better prepared for when the situation comes up in the future. I think that's always helpful and that's what makes you grow. So the scale in, of what I'm doing has changed, but what I'm doing hasn't, if that uh, kind of resonates with anyone. Um, but the first year and a half when I, I always say this, the first year and a half of switching to commercial, I have never in my life learned more on one single topic um, than in multifamily. I mean, the amount of information that you need to know. um, My partner is Jay Scott and he came from residential as well. And he continually says to me, you know, we've been working for years and he continually says to me, there's just so much, like every time I think, you know, like I know everything, then you say something else. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know that. Or I didn't even think of it. And he's still saying that um, today. And that's another great thing about the industry is it's always changing and it's a living um, environment in which we operate. So you have to keep up with, there's so many different aspects of commercial real estate. What's amazing about commercial real estate is you can take any single person you ever meet in life and they will have a strength, no matter what, everyone has a strength and they have a background 
And what's great about multifamily, large multifamily properties is you can take any single person and plug them into a part of the business because there are so many roles that need to be filled. Um, so it's just a matter of learning your strength, knowing who you are really, really well and exploiting those strengths and not being someone who feels like they need to fill all the voids of things they don't know. Um, you know, I just talked about learning and educating yourself, but that doesn't mean that you have to be the person accountable for that specific task. You just have to be knowledgeable that that task is going on and allow someone else to be the expert of that task while you're an expert of another task. So um, I think that is, that has been my mindset throughout my entire life and to really come into situations in more of a team fashion. Um, and that's why I think we've been able to be successful. It's, do, do you feel like asset management and construction management is the creative side of commercial real estate? It's the problem solving side. If you're really good at being a detective, you're really good at problem solving. If you're really good at multitasking and you don't get, like I get stressed out once in a while, but people always are like, how do you get everything done that you get done? You have so much on your plate, but it's a matter of just being efficient with your time. Um, and I guess creative, like creative in a business sense. Um, I don't think of it creative in, in art sense or a decorator sense, but in, you know, in that traditional definition of creativity, but creativity in the sense of thinking outside the box or marrying multiple concepts together. One thing I think I'm really good at is I'm really good at looking at a problem. And this is the essence of problem solving, but I'm really good at looking at a problem from multiple vantage points and then trying to make the best decision based off of a 360 view of the problem. So, you know, we're, we're executing a contract right now and I'm looking at it from the investor's point of view. I'm looking at it from our, our contractor's feasibility point of view, our property management company's feasibility in terms of, you know, the due diligence and being able to audit financials in terms of our feasibility business-wise, in terms of our ability to secure the loan, in terms of all these different components. And um, that is something that I think um, you need someone on your team that can do that. I mean, you know, speaking of roles, there's so many different roles that you need on a team, but you need someone with that kind of mindset that understands every aspect too of what's going on throughout the life cycle of the, the acquisition and the hold and the um, disposition so that everything's accounted for. So, think, so decisions are being made in silos and not considering other components to the deal. Yeah, and, and I guess that's, that's what I meant by, you know, sort of the creative side, that, that problem solver, the having, having the vision of how to put all the pieces together, not, not like what paint colors you choose and things like that. I, it, it's more of a, a bigger picture creativity, but I think because that there's, as you said, there's so many different angles to look at each situation and every problem that comes up. And it's, if you look at it from only one angle, then maybe that's, you know, you might make the wrong decision in, in impacting some other component. If you haven't thought of all of that and kind of put it together um, tell me a little bit about, let's switch gears a little, tell me a little bit about, about your book and kind of what, what was the inspiration behind that? And, and so how, to, how did you put that together? I attended the Dave Van Horn, uh, Mid-Atlantic conference, uh, three years ago, and I was invited to sit, uh, at one of the lunches with all of the other women in attendance, all the women got invited um, to have a lunch with the co-founders of the Real Estate Investor community. And while we were having lunch, I looked around the room and thought to myself, how in a room of 450 attendees are there only 14 women sitting at this table? And it baffled me. And um, 
to be honest, that's one of the best conferences that I've attended and attend every single year. The caliber of real estate professionals in that room is truly out. I mean, it's just outstanding. It's mind blowing. So to only have 14 women in attendance is, um, you know, it was just shocking to me and it's a huge deficit to everyone in the room because there's not as much diversity in the room, but also to a deficit to women who are not in attendance or maybe not know about this conference or whatever the reason may be. So on the ride home after that, um, because my husband also attended with me, I said, I'm going to write a book called The Only Woman in the Room, and it is going to speak about women in real estate. I didn't know at the time that it would be um, take the form that it did, which is uh, 19 other women telling their stories through different chapters. Uh, but I did know that I wanted to highlight all of the women in real estate and give them a platform in which to tell their story. I think women are very reluctant to be very boisterous in a room and command a room most of the time. I don't think it's all the time, but I'll often. And a lot of times women are more qualified than the keynote speakers, but because they aren't very boisterous, they, their story is not being heard and they're not self-advocating. So what ends up happening is you have a ton of speakers that are better at self-promoting than um, in the experience, which is what you really should be listening to. You should be listening to people who are the most experienced in the room. Um, so long story short is I thought that the book would provide a platform for women's voices to be heard, credibility for women who may or may not have a book behind their name. So it would give them opportunities to be the keynote speaker. And then selfishly, I have two daughters and I want them to have more role models to look up to in the industry. So it was very rewarding for myself personally, um, because at some point my daughters are going to be in an age where they don't think mom's cool and they're going to need other people to look up to. And now I have 19 other women I can direct them to, to say, you know, this is an industry that anyone can be successful in. It doesn't matter your age, race, gender, sexual orientation, you know, it doesn't matter whatever, um, wherever you came from, whatever walk of life you're, you're, you're taking, um, you can be successful in real estate. So that was important to me. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel sure your daughters are always going to, they may always show it outwardly, but they're always going to think mom's a badass because, <laughs> because if there's plenty of evidence out there, I, I think, uh, and it, the, I, I do miss the FAQ Fridays with them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I will get them back. They're a little bit on strike for a while. So I have to, <laughs> they, want, they want to pay them them. <laughs> They're renegotiating contracts. <laughs> yeah. They're renegotiating. That is actually a way, you know, um, speaking of ways in which you can, you can pay your kids um, and tax benefits um, for marketing. That is um, a way that we are doing it um, to get them started investing early. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's a great idea. I've, I've been sort of my kids are younger, but I, as soon as they're at a point where it makes, I don't know, <laughs> where the IRS might think it makes sense for them to do some things like that, I, I definitely. Uh, want to do the, do similar uh, similar type things? I think it'll be it'll just be fun, really. Yeah. Benefits or not, it'll just be fun. Um, well, let, let's. I, I I could talk to you forever. But I don't want to keep you all day, and I know you've got uh, impending storm coming. So, um, <laughs> we'll just move to the section where um, I'll ask you a few questions. Uh, the first one is uh, related to the name of the podcast being "Know Your Why." So, Ashley, what is your why? What what kind of drives you? Uh, I think you've touched on a few things that are important to you through this conversation, but what what really um, what really keeps you going? You've already achieved a lot, but obviously you're still very driven. My family. So I think that's probably the number one answer you get. But um, to me, it's important to be there for my family anytime they need. My parents, I grew up in um, a very different situation than my children are growing up in. And both of my parents worked very hard and they didn't have the opportunity 
not to work. They didn't have that choice, but they were always there for everything. They both did jobs that allowed them to attend every sporting event, every, you know, theatrical performance, whatever piano performance, whatever we had, they were there for my uh, brother and myself. And it was very meaningful to me. And I am very appreciative of the support that they showed throughout my entire life. And that is my number one driver. I never want to be in a situation where I cannot cancel my entire day and just go support my children. So that's my number one driver. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. And I, it's, I mean, it's same for me. I, I uh, missed a lot of, uh, you know, like yourself, like work, work hard, work a lot, but worked in ways that I didn't necessarily have control over it. And so I have always, I've missed a lot of family things, but now that I have kids, that's, I, it's just not acceptable. And so that's, that's really what's gotten me, you know, very excited about real estate and that having that just pure, you know, time control essentially. Um, so next question in, <laughs> this might be hard because you have been on so many podcasts, but maybe can you tell us something about yourself that uh, isn't common knowledge? Um, skill, a hobby, whatever that, whatever that might be. Um, I've mentioned on a few podcasts that I uh, ride horses and a lot of people know that um, through Instagram. I once in a while will post, um, but I don't think many people know that I won the nation in 2013. So I didn't really, I don't really talk about that that much, um, but I, um, I won it on a horse that I had called Soho. Um, and it's something I'm very, very proud of. Um, and I love riding and competing. Um, so yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that's extremely impressive. I, horses scare me a little bit. I've been, been around <laughs> plenty, but I also know that they're much bigger than me and, and, uh, and very strong. So I, I, I like to stick with the smaller animals, but yeah, they're, they're beautiful animals. And someday I think I would like to have some horses that I can just watch and go out and pet maybe, you know, slow trail rides, but yeah, at a competitive level, I, that's incredibly impressive. Just, we were actually watching some of the, um, the Olympics, the, the equestrian events in the Olympics. And I was just, I mean, the control that pe that you, people, like people that are competing at that level, the control and, and the symmetry between the horse and the rider is just kind of incredible. I, I don't, uh, it's not something that I'm comfortable with, but I, when I see that it's, it's kind of amazing. Um, so, uh, what, what, if, if people want to reach out to you, how, how would you think would be the best way to get in touch? Um, you can reach out to me on our company website, which is bardowninvestments.com. You can also follow me on Instagram at badash investor. Okay, perfect. And last question, Ashley, what piece of advice would you have for people um, that maybe like yourself, you know, a few years ago when they're sort of getting started, kind of what would you tell them uh, to encourage them or, or give them advice? I would say that if you seek out people who are further along in their journey, that is something that you want to pursue, um, provide value and don't ask for anything in return. There is a huge amount of people that contact me and ask questions all the time, um, or they want to work with us, but they're always wanting something in return. And um, they're not leading with the value that they're providing. It's just like, this is what my deficit is. You know, how, it, can you help me find brokers? Can you help me find capital? No, I've worked 10 years to find it myself. You know, I'm not just helping you skip all of that hard work. It also shows me too that, I know this is harsh to say, but that, that's someone I would never want to work with ever. Because if they're leading with me, 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 then that's not aligned with how our team works. So um, that is something that, you know, is just a hard, 
no for me. I'm just turned off by it. And I used to spend a lot of time um, helping people and answering every single question I got on Instagram. And now it's just too time consuming. And I'm realizing every time I spend answering these questions, it's time I spent helping my team or helping my family and being with my family. So um, I think if, you know, and there are a lot of other people who are much further along and more successful than I am. So I imagine when I get to those individuals level, I'm going to have even less time. And this whole thought that I have of leading with value is going to be more ingrained than it already is to me today. So I would recommend that you always lead with your strength and what value you can provide someone and hope that they provide value back to you by just the association or, you know, that to me is every single person that I work with today, that's how they, they interact. Every person that I network with, that's how they interact. That's how I interact. Um, you know, we're always trying to help each other, not just constantly ask for things. Once you develop a relationship later on, you know, sure. Do I call up some of my friends and say, Hey, I'm dealing with this really hard situation. Can you help me? But we have a, an established track record at that time. I'm not just constantly asking, but not giving. So, um, I would recommend that it's not very specifically real estate related as much as it is a life lesson, but I think it applies in real estate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Ble don't, don't start relationships with want, right? You just <laughs> try to see where you can help them out. Um, well, great. This has been awesome. Uh, you know, th thank you so much. I really do appreciate your time. I, I know you're very busy and um, thank you for, for all that you've shared with us today. Absolutely. Thank you again for having me on. Sure. Absolutely. All right. Have a great day, everyone.